People change. Opinions change. Places change. Thoughts change. Time never stands still. At Surrey, we're adapting and striving for better. Teaching advances. Learning develops. Our approach evolves. Methods move on. Progress. Student needs evolve. We listen and respond. Connections deepen. Support grows. Facilities improve. Global partners connect. Relationships grow. New faces arrive. Lives are changed. Research evolves. Knowledge broadens. Collaboration inspires us. Discoveries are made. Communities are brought together, taking care of each other, reaching out, learning together. A pandemic ensues. The world stands still. We join forces, take steps forward. The nation applauds our heroes. Sorry, heroes. We're in this together. Growing. Learning. Sharing. Supporting. And wonderful things happen. Here at Surrey, we never stand still. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Tim Jackson. I'm the director of, of CUSP, the Centre for the Understanding of Sustainable Prosperity at the University of Surrey. Um, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this latest event in the a What It Takes series, um, which is celebrating Surrey alumni um, in the various roles that they took as they left the university and, and went into what is affectionately called real life. I've actually stayed in Surrey. I, new faces definitely arrive and some faces stay for quite a long time, but they always remember the early faces, the ones who were there when they first arrived. And so it's a particular pleasure really to welcome Kirsty as the late of our speakers in the What It Takes series because she was one of the first cohorts of students that I taught. Well, you know, again, I'm using a few euphemisms. I think I probably learned as much from those early students as they learned from me. And, and as I'm fond of telling my class, one of the reasons one has students, of course, is that they go out into the world and come back richer, wiser, and cleverer than you ever were in the first place. And with experience that can then provide, provide learning for the next cohort of students. And Kirsty was very much one of those, Dr. Kirsty McIntyre. Um, she's now Global Sustainability Director at Diageo, and she's going to be talking to us about what it takes to be a sustainable business. And back in those early days when um, Kirsty was here at Surrey doing her engineering doctorate, that topic of what a sustainable business could and should be was really in its infancy. And, and over that intervening period, it is people like Kirsty who have taken ideas of sustainability into business at every level. And developed, I think, what is now a pressing case for sustainability in a world that's challenged by climate change, by biodiversity loss, by the decline in, in the quality of oceans and rivers and soils 
and in the resource issues that that uh, give rise um, to a, a degraded environment for our children and for their children. And and you could say in a way that 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 task of of representing sustainability in business is is quite a challenging one. Business certainly, when Kirsty started out, was very much still operating under the the maxim: the business of business is business. And it, it's had to adapt fast. And it's people like Katie who have facilitated facilitated those changes. And and so I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit for twenty minutes or so about her journey since she left Surrey, um, which has in, included uh, 28 years managing sustainability in the electronics sector, which accidentally has given away how long I've been in Surrey, um, and and also the new role which she's taken on at Diageo, which she's had to take on in the context of a global pandemic and putting a team together, more or less, more or less I think, without ever meeting any of them. So, Kirsty, I'm going to hand over to you now, and I'm delighted that you could join us. Thank you so much for coming, and we're looking forward to hearing your journey. Thanks, Tim, and uh, and thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you for that introduction. I agree, it is somewhat disconcerting when you write down how long you've been doing something, and it does actually turn into a sort of decades uh, rather than a few years, and I don't really know where that time has gone. So yeah, I um, I did my engineering doctorate at uh, back in Surrey, and uh, just to give you a bit of background on that one, I actually uh, was one of the groups, uh, one of a group of students who was working in industry. So I started off with Xerox and being sponsored by Xerox, and I uh, really worked on what became life cycle analysis. But we didn't have a name for it then; it hadn't been called life cycle analysis. And what's very interesting is that actually my new life cycle analyst has just joined my team at Diageo this week. And so I feel like I'm, I'm coming complete circle on these things where uh, not only do I learn how to do something at university, I then translate it into a corporate world and then start hiring the next generation of corporate people who then work on those same topics. And uh, I'll be happy to take questions uh, later about how we're going to use that uh, LCA and what we're going to use it for uh, within a business context. So I'm just going to set myself up with sharing my screen. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about today what it takes to be a sustainable business. And I'm going to talk about, as Tim said, my new role uh, here at Diageo and, and where Diageo is coming from on this one. So for those of you who perhaps have not heard of Diageo, and I have to say, uh, before I joined the company in August last year, I, I think I'd heard the name, but I didn't really equate it with what Diageo actually is and does. So it was formed about 15 years ago by the merger of Grand Metropolitan and uh, Guinness. And these are some of the key, the bigger brands that, Guinness, uh, that uh, Diageo makes and sells and ships all over the world. So you can see that we sell our products in 180 countries, uh, production in more than 200 sites, over 30 countries. Uh, with 28,000 people um, in the company uh, overall. But bizarrely enough, this is the smallest company I've ever worked for since I left Surrey. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm downscaling. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're probably very familiar with the products that Diageo makes more than the company itself. So when you think about the scale that this is, so this equates to, uh, the business equates to 1.8 billion pints of Guinness uh, which are sold and drunk each year. And then uh, if you're more into your spirits, then that equates to 284 million litres of Smirnoff uh, sold uh, and drunk per year. And you can see these other brands as well. I didn't have numbers for all the other brands, but they're pretty big. Um, this these sort of companies grow by acquisition. So uh, Diageo bought uh, Chase uh, Gin and Vodka um, earlier this year, and then before then bought uh, Aviation Gin, uh, which is fronted by Ryan Reynolds. They also own um, I'm trying to think, Casa Amigos, which is fronted by uh, George Clooney. Um, so it's very much a brand-led uh, company, which is quite different for me having come from the electronics sector. My previous job was with HP, uh, Hewlett Packard, and I was there for nearly 20 years. And so this is quite a different, uh, quite a different sort of company, and I'm really enjoying that difference. And also, uh, and somewhat relieved that sustainability travels no matter what industry sector you're in. I need to make sure that I'm moving forward. 
Um, so this is sort of a breakdown about where they are. The reason I'm showing supply chain and procurement is that I am global director for sustainability and I'm sat in the supply chain and procurement uh, organization. And in my opinion, this is the best place to be if you're looking to affect real sustainable change and sustainability change within a company. Um, because we are in control a lot of what happens with where we buy uh, components, um, where we make them, how we make them, and what we do with shipping them to customers and consumers. And so for me, I, this, uh, this sort of place to sit within supply chain, and this is where I was as well within HP, uh, having been around in that 20 years about all sorts of different corporate functions, but definitely supply chain and procurement is, uh, or manufacturing is definitely the right place to be. So Tim asked me to talk a little bit today about what is the platform of, of where this sustainability ambition comes from for Diageo. And I'll talk about where it is, and then I'll, 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 but I'll show you where it comes from. I know there's a lot of, a lot of uh, words on this slide. This is Diageo's purpose. This is its creed. This is what they give you when you arrive at Diageo on the first day that you arrive. So I got this on the, on the 1st of August last year. And it really talks about what is the company all around. The piece that the, the piece that I want to draw your attention to is this element here. Now, oops, sorry, I'll go back. Uh, is number six here, which is about pioneering grain to glass sustainability. And so you can see that their sustainability ambition is in their corporate purpose. It's led from the top and throughout. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about how that is framed up. Uh, and what happened, but this performance ambition was rewritten, I think in, it predates me, so that's what I'm saying, I think, I think it was about 2017, and then in 2020, we relaunched our 2030 ambition. So I'll show you a little video now, it sort of summarizes that, and then I'll unpack it a little bit more for you in terms of what my team and I are doing. <laughs> are a company built by entrepreneurs and people of extraordinary character. Since Arthur Guinness signed a 9,000 year lease and John Walker and Son sent the finest whiskey from Scotland to the world, we've had ambition. The Spirit of Progress is our 10 year action plan to help create a more inclusive and sustainable world to change the way the world drinks for the better by celebrating moderation and continuing to address alcohol-related harm. In the next decade, we will reach 1 billion people with messages of moderation from our brands and educate people on alcohol-related harm through our global Drink IQ platform. Our alcohol education program, Smashed, will educate over 10 million people on the dangers of underage drinking. And we will also change the attitudes towards drink driving of 5 million people. Championing inclusion and diversity is core to our purpose. And we want the diversity of our customers and consumers to be reflected in the people who shape our business. Our ambition is to achieve 50% representation of women in leadership roles, with 45% of our leaders from ethnically diverse backgrounds. We will also help support a thriving and inclusive hospitality sector, providing skills and training to 1.7 million people through Diageo Bar Academy and Learning for Life. We are also going further to preserve the natural resources on which we all depend. We will reach net zero carbon across our operations, switching our sources of direct energy to be 100% renewable. And we will reduce the carbon in our supply chain by 50%. Water is critical to life and our business, and we will lead collective action to preserve the world's water. Every drink we make will use 30% less water than it does today. And by 2026, we'll replenish more water than we use in water-stressed areas, delivering over 150 community water projects around the world. We will 
also make sure that 60% of our packaging will be made from recycled material and 100% of our packaging will be widely recyclable. We will also develop innovative partnerships to help create a more circular economy and we will help to regenerate and restore the landscapes and resources we rely on, supporting smallholder farmers with agricultural skills. We are passionate about the role our brands play in celebrating life the world over. We have a responsibility to grow our business in the right way, from grain to glass, and a responsibility to ensure our people, partners, and communities can thrive. This is how we will continue to celebrate life every day, everywhere. Society 2030. Celebrate the spirit of progress. So I think you can see from, from the, that video about some of the aspects that Tim talked about in his interaction. We talk about biodiversity, we talk about agriculture, we talk about communities, and we also talk about, uh, talk about resources as in low carbon world and circular economy. So there's lots of aspects in this that, that sort of I've come through. So why have we why have we set this up? And I'll unpack that a little bit more and then talk about specifically what my role is within that large program. So clearly, for those of you who have been watching the United Nations Develop, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, you know, this is the decade of action uh, from 2020 to 2030. And really, this is our spirit of progress is our 10 year action plan towards those achievement of those SDGs within our com uh, company, our communities and for society. And the reason is behind this. And I think it's what's quite interesting being in a company that's been uh, had products. So Johnny Walker is 200 years old this year. Um, and so to think about a company that's been around and been making products for that long, they have every intention of being around for the next two centuries as well. And that's really where that comes from is the desire to be, you know, to have that longevity as an organization, as a business. Um, and and there, there is when you think about this, there's quite a lot of risk for companies who are slow to act. Um, and then there is opportunity for those who sort of jump on it now and get, get ahead of the game. So um, we talked a little bit about that society 2030 spirit of progress. And it's really about delivering a positive impact on society wherever we live, work, source and sell. Now, the video talked a little bit about positive drinking and then also about inclusion and diversity. Uh, these are programs that are within that overall framework where my role is very much around is that environmental part of sustainability. And so what I take care of is this pioneering grain to glass sustainability, which if you remember when I showed you that, that paper with all, of the, with all of the words on it, our performance ambition was called must do six. So, uh, and underneath that, then I have these three pillars around water, uh, carbon and becoming sustainable by design. So that's what I'm gonna focus in on for the next sort of 10 minutes or so. <clears throat> so what we've done is we've put together some very bold goals um, around, those, uh, around those three areas, around positive drinking, inclusion, diversity, and pioneer grain to glass sustainability. And these are the ones I think that came up in the video. Uh, I also have more. So uh, you can look on our website um, when we did the launch of this in November last year. Um, and um, you know, you'll see that we have 25 uh, major corporate goals, of which half of which are about uh, sort of the environmental part of sustainability. Um, and so what I'm going to do is go through some of those things that we're doing now specifically. So I'm going to start off with water. Um, and really, um, the uh, as you might remember from the video, um, we said that we would be, uh, every drink that we make by 2030 will have 30% less water in it than we have today. And that by 2026, then we will replenish more water than we use in our water stressed areas. As you can imagine, as a drinks company, water is not only very important from an environmental perspective, it's incredibly important to our business. You cannot make a drink without water. And so this is, this is that, that sort of matching up together of both what's right to do from a corporate responsibility uh, and a community perspective, but also what's right for our business in order to sustain it going forward. Um, and so we've already had some really great results uh, this year. 
Um, so, for example, in our progress, so in our African sites, they are a key driver in our global water efficiency. Um, and so I measure efficiency across all of those, um, uh, all across all of our 150 sites with, with about litre per litre of product produced. So I look at water coming in and then the product coming out. And that's that water efficiency that we measure there. Um, and across Africa this year, we've achieved uh, um, about a 15% about a reduction in our water consumption, um, which is really great. And there's a whole range. And I think what I'm finding very interesting here is there's a whole range of um, activities that go behind that. Um, not just some large industrial uh, investments that we've made, but also tweaks to processes that like we reduce some of the pressures in some of the vessels in the brewing sites in Nigeria. And then it's also matched up to uh, behavior change. So a lot of this has been about education of the workforce and then also um, of the community around us as well in terms of water use. And so I think for me, this is what I find very interesting in working in these areas in sustainability is that, you, you know, it, it's a technical challenge, it's a data challenge, and then it's also a, a, a human behavior and how we all work together sort of challenge. What we've also done this year is we've carried out a refresh of our water stress assessment globally. And what that's done for us, as you can imagine, with climate change happening, the last one we did was in 2018, so not very long ago, but we've actually, more of our sites are now considered to be water stressed. And in fact, it's gone up by 40%. So in just three years, 40% more of our sites are considered to be water stressed than they were previously. And I'm sure you can imagine where they are in the world as well. So, you know, this tells us that, that um, not only is water becoming uh, a greater sustainability issue from a sort of uh, from a sort of macro level, but from a micro level, we need to be really careful about what we manufacture, how we manufacture it, and where we manufacture it um, to make sure that we have that longevity of, of of business. Next, moving into accelerate to a low carbon world. So the two commitments we've made within here is that our, our, our operations will be net carbon zero by 2030. So that uh, for those of you who know more about such things, that's scope one and two. Um, and then we will be powered 100% by renewable electricity by 2030. We're currently at just over 60%. Um, so we're doing pretty well on electricity, although uh, the majority of our energy needs are from heat and fuel. Um, and so electricity is important but we really do need to focus on, on our other energy needs. Um, within scope three, so that's the carbon within our supply chain, we will halve the carbon in our supply chain by 2030. Um, and, and that is an enormous task. The majority of our carbon within our supply chain sits within agriculture. So the growing and the production of crops that we use to make our products. And then also in the packaging that we use the glass bottles, the aluminium cans, the cardboard boxes, you know, so there, there's a lot and there are big supply chains. Uh, they might not be as complex as the supply chains I was used to dealing with in my past in electronics, but they are very big. And as you can imagine, there are thousands and thousands of farmers that we would deal with within that supply chain. So some of the progress that we've made, for those of you who are uh, um, technology geeks, you might be quite interested, is that we, uh, we, have, um, we are sponsoring uh, the plans to develop the Port of Cromarty Green Hydrogen Hub. And so what this aims to do is create hydrogen, which we do believe, uh, or we're pretty sure will be the fuel of the future, uh, particularly in Scotland. Um, and the Scottish government is pushing quite hard on its development within carbon infrastructure. And this is really about the production in the Cromarty of Firth to produce, store and distribute green hydrogen at scale. And so what we will do is we will work with them and then we will hopefully be taking carbon from, uh, rather hydrogen from that to be able to run our distilleries in that area. So again, very interesting. Uh, and the investment I think that Diageo is prepared to make, and I'll talk a little bit about more about that, about novel technologies I find very exciting. Within carbon, there are enormous challenges to us. So we have, as I said before, we have a huge mountain to climb within scope three, within our supply chain. Um, we also have a, a lot of effort around renewable energy and efficiency. Um, you know, for example, uh, in some parts of the world, there is no renewable electricity for us to buy. The infrastructure does not exist. 
And so, again, that will become with big uh, um, infrastructure partnerships between ourselves, governments, banks, and lots of other companies to help build that renewable uh, energy infrastructure in those countries where none exists quite current currently. We're in the process of applying to be verified by the science-based target initiative uh, on our carbon. Uh, I'll let you know how that goes when we get it. It's, uh, it's been quite tough progress, I, I think, to date. Um, and uh, we will, but we hope to be successful um, with getting that verified later this year. Um, some of the other things that, that so you might have read about, which is about carbon offsetting, clearly we will never get to no carbon whatsoever. And so there will be a little tiny amount that we will offset uh, somewhere in our business. But what are good offsets versus bad offsets? And how do we know what we're buying and that the forest that we've bought into isn't going to get cut down next year? And then that carbon won't, you know, that carbon offset won't exist anymore. So we're very much looking into nature based solutions with that carbon offsetting and working out what is the right percentage. And the science based target will help us with that as well. Um, but we're very clear that when we say net zero, the emphasis is on zero and not the netting. Um, and so we're very clear that that's where we have to get to. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of uh, lots of conversation about what is the lowest footprint technology. And this is one of the reasons why I've hired an LCA specialist is really to help us make not just the comparisons between is this bottle a lower carbon footprint than that bottle, but also, uh, you know, is this technology a better technology than this one? Uh, and how are we going there? You know, there is there water treatment, which is what we do as well. Water treatment has tends to have a very high carbon footprint. Um, and so, you know, we need to be able to present those choice points and those decision points to the business so that they make the right decision on what they're investing in. Um, and then we need to think about novel uh, innovation, novel technology, about on-site or near-site generation, uh, and then direct versus indirect as well. Lots and lots of decisions that we need to be making. To talk about by becoming sustainable by design, this is quite a large area and we're still unpacking it, to be really honest with you. And so some of the things that are very clear with us is that we need to think about regenerative agriculture. We need to think about circularity and circular economy. So some of the some of the targets we put up here might seem a little pedestrian to you. Uh, what I would say is that this is a very large area and there is lots more to come and we're working on it. But clearly we will have zero waste and we do currently have zero waste from our direct operations. Um, and we will ensure that 100% of our packaging is widely recyclable. Uh, and that in itself is an enormous project because of course, the definition of what widely recyclable is determined by the infrastructure that is available in the country that you're selling the product. And so let's say for the UK and Germany, it, it, it's pretty straightforward to recycle things. We have great recycling infrastructure. Then you have to do an education program to help people do it in the right way. However, when we move to uh, countries like Venezuela that have clearly other challenges on their plate, um, then the definition of widely recyclable is not the same as it is in other, in other countries. And you might even think that the US would be a great country for recycling. Uh, it is on the West Coast and the East Coast and in the middle, which is where the majority of our glass bottles are made. Actually, the recycling infrastructure is very poor um, and we need to really push that. If we're to achieve that 60% recycled content in our packaging, we actually are going to have to be the catalyst uh, and the instigator of recycling infrastructure in various countries, particularly in those big markets. So some of the progress that we've made, and you might have seen this, this came out uh, um, last year, last summer, is that hopefully next year, I'm saying hopefully, because it is really challenging to make a paper bottle that carries a solvent, otherwise known as whiskey. Um, and so we will launch the world's first ever 100% uh, paper bottle uh, made from sustainable uh, source wood. Um, it will be, uh, it will do it on a probably quite a small basis. You're not going to see it in your local Tesco's, for example, straight away. We'll probably try it out with some of our bar uh, uh, and on trade partners. Um, but clearly, that that bottle will have a much lower carbon footprint than glass, uh, than glass, and is easy to recycle. And that aligns with our goals. And I'll just show you this one here. I got sent this last week 
So this is, a, again, another trial that we're doing. This is black and white whiskey. In fact, this was intended for the Columbia market. This bottle is 100% recycled glass and has been made by a furnace that is uh, um, powered by waste biofuel. So this glass bottle actually has a 90% lower carbon footprint than our standard green glass whiskey bottle. So and we have a lot of these products, uh, a lot of these trials and these pilots going on. We bought 173,000 of those bottles really to see how they would go down the high speed packing line. And then also how they would manage in quite a, uh, let me say, rough and tumble market like Colombia, uh, where perhaps the logistics is a little bit rougher on, on uh, fragile products uh, than it might be in, in let's say, the UK or, or the USA. So the challenge really within this is that a lot of our carbon and water footprint, eight, over 80% of it resides with our suppliers in the supply chain. So really, this, this effort around packaging is not just what you see, it's what happens in the making of that packaging and, and the design of that packaging uh, before it gets to the uh, shop or the bar. Um, I talked a little bit about innovation. Together with uh, um, Society 2030 Spirit of Progress, we also launched Diageo Sustainable Solutions. Uh, and you can go and have a look on the website in this. Um, and what we're really looking for here is that we have a very clear understanding, and that's one of the things I've really enjoyed about coming to work for Diageo, is that they're quite humble in with regard to their knowing how we're going to achieve those goals. So genuinely, with those goals that I put up, we have a fairly clear understanding of how we're going to get to probably about uh, 2025, 2026. The back end of the decade becomes a lot looser in terms of what, how we close that innovation gap. And so we know it's there. And so that's why we launched this innovation fund, which really invites innovators of all sorts. So small businesses, startups, universities, think tanks, all sorts of different things to really share and develop their ideas. And so we launched this in November. We had nearly 300 applications. We whittled that down to a shortlist and we're just about to launch eight pilots across six countries. And our initial focus areas are in uh, renewable energy and renewable energy storage, uh, in um, water recycling, um, also some very innovative glass, um, um, and also within our, our smallholder farmer and farmer engagement. And so there's some really interesting things in there. So this is my roadmap. When it says, what does it come to, what does it mean to be a sustainable business or what does it take to be a sustainable business? You've got to make a plan, even if you don't know how you're going to get to the end. And so this is the plan that I have laid out over the next uh, over the next decade. It is very, I have to be honest, it's very disconcerting to have a 10 year target. <laughs> Most of us don't work like that in life. And I've said it certainly never worked uh, where I've actually had a 10 year out goal and then not known how to close the gap at the end of it. But these, these are the things that have started. So what I'm doing in this year is laying the foundations for success. Um, as Tim said, I've hired a team in the middle of a pandemic. I have still not yet met anybody in Diageo or visited a Diageo site or an office. And so all of this has been done remotely, like all of us are working remotely at the moment. It is pretty challenging to onboard a new team and a new goal with you, uh, remotely, but we're, we're doing our best and we're working it as the best of our ability. So this is sort of, if you like, the sort of foundations of getting those all right. Then I'm looking for that step change. And so what I laid out here is, so I don't quite know how I'm going to do this, but what I laid out with is what is that vision for that change going to look like? And my vision is that consumers will actively choose Diageo brands due to our 2030 sustainability credentials. So that when you walk into a bar, let you know, hopefully we'll all be able to do that so again soon. But when you walk into a bar, you choose to drink uh, a Tanqueray gin over another brand because you've heard of the great things that Tanqueray and Diageo have been doing. Uh, and, you know, I'd love to be able to, to have that impact on both the knowledge of consumers and the capabilities of Diageo to, to do that and then communicate it effectively. So this is, this is, again, some of the progress we've made this year. I did the, I made this slide yesterday, and I actually am very proud about what we've done so far this year. So this is um, in the bottom right-hand corner. That's the glass bottle that I just showed you, uh, the black and white uh, whiskey bottle. Um, Johnny Walker. So we've got a mix here of brand 
um, and also uh, with the corporate. And I think this is what's really interesting, again, working for a company that's very brand led, is that I have the opportunity to talk on two levels. So we can talk about what Johnny Walker is doing. And Johnny Walker launched this enormous sustainability pledge uh, around what they will do. And it is, of course, derivative of what the whole company will do. And then they've gone further. And then they've got talked about they're, they're, Johnny Walker is going to plant a million trees. They're also uh, um, restoring over 100 acres of peat uh, wetland. And, and peat wetland or peat upland, I'm not quite sure how you say it, peat wetland, let's call it, um, actually holds more carbon than a forest does. And so it's, it's quite important that we do these sort of things. Um, and then you've got sort of also what the corporation is saying. I'm very lucky also to work for a company that has true board and executive level engagement. I have spent more time talking to Diageo board than honestly is really that comfortable. Uh, they ask a lot of really tricky questions and pose a lot of difficult challenges. And, and this is what's so great about it is that, you know, I go there and they say, well, well, we want more, we want more. What else can you do? How can you do it faster? And that's a great challenge to have. And then we get down to some of the nuts and bolts in the bottom left-hand corner where uh, within Guinness, we've just recently announced that we've taken off all of the plastic wrap uh, off uh, multi-packs. So whether you're buying 24 cans or whether you're buying four or six cans, they will no longer come with plastic. You might still see them in your local supermarket, but basically they will all be phased out over the next few weeks um, as we move these things out. Um, the other thing is, is that it doesn't really come across in that middle section, but we've got some videos about how we are launching our, our new brand homes. This is particularly in Scotland, but we'll roll out the rest of the world. And so as we're opening these new, so you can go and see how uh, um, Royal Loch Nagar whiskey is made, and you can go visit uh, the different various homes of Johnny Walker. As we open them, we're opening them as carbon neutral. And we now have got eight green tourism awards for those sites in Scotland. So, what does it take to be a sustainable business? And this is me nine months into my new job. Um, you do have to have action plans. Uh, this is where it comes down to the nuts and bolts. They are complicated uh, and you need short, medium and long term approaches. The business wants to know wh what's happened this year. What do I need to plan for for the next three years? And what's our trajectory out to our 10 year goal? The other thing that I'm also learning is that it's a pick and mix approach. There, whereas hydrogen we think is a good bet for the future, we can't wait until hydrogen comes in um, because that might be some way off and it is very open to political winds, let's put it that way. So we'll need other approaches to get us towards that net carbon uh, zero by 2030. And so what, what will be our approaches? And it will be pick and mix. It is not a one size fits all, particularly when you're manufacturing in 50 countries around the world. I spend a lot of time talking to finance, a lot of time. And so, you know, we're, we are looking at carbon accounting very, very closely. And I expect you'll see an announcement come out from us later this year about carbon accounting. We're also learning about things, financing mechanisms such as power purchase agreements. That could be one of those ways, for example, that we are able to build renewable energy infrastructure into countries that have none. And then you get down to the nuts and bolts is that when we make an investment, it's got to be ring fenced. That capex must be ring fenced and can't be whittled away uh, by other, other priorities in the business. The other things, <clears throat> excuse me, that are really clear is collaboration across corporate functions, suppliers and value chain partners. All of them come together. And, you know, I work on programs with uh, I work on projects, uh, particularly around climate change risk where um, in, I, I lead that program for Diageo, but there is um, people we have, we have corporate relations, we have corporate accounting, I have a corporate uh, strategy in there, uh, we have uh, procurement, you know, there's a whole range of people that come together and you have to learn how to collaborate and talk those other people's language, because often they don't talk the language of sustainability. Moving over to the right hand side, I would say, keep, the eye, keep your eye on the prize. I have to focus on that end goal. It's very easy to get too close to the coal face. You can't see the wood from the trees. And then it's very difficult to know if you're heading in the right direction. So I have to focus hard on that end goal while we work the detail uh, at a site level. My other, my other point was that just don't put it off. Don't, don't wait for tomorrow what you can do today. Because although it's 10 years, 
I have to say that sometimes it feels quite, I feel quite panicky when I think about regenerative agriculture, we really only have eight crop cycles left to achieve what we want to achieve within our regenerative agriculture program. Um, because you can only make a change once a year because of that crop growing. So, you know, it, 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 I think there's a famous saying, isn't there, is that, you know, the best time to plant a tree is 10 years ago. That This is exactly the same thing, is that we need to do it now. Within that innovation, we have to take risks. We're wanting to spread our net wide. We want to hear from as many people as we possibly can. We know we don't have the answers uh, and we need to be quick at adopting. And that's sometimes quite a challenge for a big company. Data is so important when it comes to sustainability. I think when people consider, uh, think about sustainability, think, oh, we're out here hugging trees. Uh, I spend most of my time on spreadsheets. Uh, and that sounds very dull, but it is what actually drives change within a business. And, and using those KPIs that drive behavior and not just reporting, developing those insights and then digitizing and using digital twins to do all your analogy uh, or rather all your analysis, um, that is by far and away the best thing to do. So uh, that is uh, what I have learned so far and the program I've been leading so far in Diageo over the last nine months. And uh, I'm going to stop sharing now and we'll go back and uh, I think we'll take some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kirsty. I've We've got a, a whole bunch of people um, asking questions. If you, as a participant, don't know where to ask, please use the Q&A, um, uh, which you should be able to see on the on the line underneath your, your Zoom window. Um, and, but we've got quite a lot there already. Um, I guess I, I kind of... Um, maybe give you a flavour of some of them. So there's quite a lot of questions around, you know, the material usage, glass versus paper and that kind of thing, and, and examples even of people who are going to paper packaging. I mean, I, I assume in a sense that, that your approach to those material choices is, is through the LCA that thinking about and, and that sort of as a, a technical issue. I mean, I don't know if there's anything more you wanted to say about about that technical process, I kind of think there's there's quite a lot of other interesting questions which are, which are broader and might be more interesting to delve into. But just to to give a sort of flavour of how you make those kinds of choices in terms of packaging and materials. Yeah, so so this is this is some of the things that is different, perhaps working for a PC company, a print company versus working for a very brand led company. You know, when I was working on packaging in my HP days, you know, packaging was there to stop the product from being damaged before it got to you at home or got to the shop. Whereas actually the packaging on a, on a bottle of whiskey is, is part of the value proposition of that bottle of whiskey or that bottle of gin. People want to put it on a bar so that it looks nice and attractive in a bar. Or you want to put it on your bar cart at home or on your kitchen counter, which is where mine sits. So I think that's what's very interesting about this is that we have to try and be enable those aesthetic choices as well as the right environmental choices. And that, that I'm enjoying very much, the, the trade-off between those. Um, and um, so it isn't just about what the LCA says. It's also about does it provide that value to the business, to marketing and brand that they're also looking for. <laughs> Um, I've, I've also got a very cheeky question, which I'm just going to mention since you did sort of mention your kind of outward sponsorship and it was sent very early on by Peter. Um, he wants to know if you can fund his master's degree uh, or if you have any of that kind of outreach, but that sort of sense of, you know, is business, are you as a business looking outwards to sponsor the people who will be the workforce for you in the future? Yeah, so, I, yeah, I, I like the question. Uh, and nothing ventured, nothing gained. Right? He's left his email address here, so, you know. Oh, that's excellent. <laughs> uh, <I'll>, um, <laughs> well, I will say that I'm hiring still. So, you know, take a look out at the jobs of Diageo if, you, if you're at that point in your career. Because um, uh, I'm very welcome. I'm very open to hearing from all sorts of different people on that. Um, so Diageo has a very big graduate program, uh, which we bring in particularly in the UK. Um, and uh, and I'm not I don't know necessarily about uh, that that we actually sponsor people to do their to do their research projects. Um, but as part of that innovation, we are actually sponsoring research centers um, and are involved in many more research project merit research centers which come through UKRI and other types of funding bodies. So it tends to be on a more macro level rather than the micro level is what I would say to that. Yeah, good. And and I wanted to I wanted to 
So to the to the finance question, a couple of people have asked have asked this question because obviously if you don't get the finance right, it's very difficult to get those innovations. I'm actually going to um, allow Felucio to talk. Um, she's asked a version of this question about the you know the feasibility of that finance and the and the obstacles to it, perhaps pushback from shareholders. Um, if I allow you to talk, Felucio. Thanks, thanks, Tim. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Well, yes. So um, really interesting. My question is, obviously, with you being a global business, it's how do you engage your leaders across that, that global business to make sure you've got the investment, both financial and from a kind of resourcing perspective, given that there will be other stakeholders in the business who have, who might push back, they might want to focus on kind of brand AMP or, or kind of putting that money into kind of engaging with the commercial side of the business. So yeah, how do you kind of engage with stakeholders who might not necessarily be brought in as, as they should be at this stage? Yeah, so it's a great question. So I think, you know, you're always you're always going to have a range of the level of buy in that people have. And there will always be competing business priorities that I feel that the role of the sustainability function, particularly the one that I manage, which is, if you like, more strategic rather than executive in this is really to challenge those views is to present those trade offs. And it's very interesting as some of the training that I have done, sorry, a long time ago around scenario planning and forecasting and backcasting, we've brought that into decision making. So for, I'll give you an example. So we're looking at investing into a new bottling line in uh, one of our African markets. And I said, well, you know, that market doesn't actually have a very mature recycling infrastructure. And so therefore, really, what we need to do is as you're building in that cost benefit, you know, that business case for that new bottling line, we need to be bringing in the cost of doing the collection and the recycling of those of those bottles at end of end of use. And so, you know, there's two hits on that. There's two aspects of that one. There is the not creating a litter, contributing to a continuing litter problem in that country. Uh, and it, because our stuff is so well branded, it's clear where it's come from. And then the second thing is that we start creating that more circular approach to materials where by if we're part of the collection and recycling infrastructure, we can bring more recycled content into our into our packaging. So, you know, it's about presenting those choice points in the right business language. And and I found very much that, you know, the, the heart is extremely willing inside Diageo, the executive heart is very much there. The investor heart, in fact, are pushing really hard. And if you read some of the, the recent business press, you'll see that certain banks have decided to pull back from investing in certain companies because they don't feel that they're making enough effort in these areas. And so we don't want to be in that situation. And so the pushback is not coming from investors. It is coming from you know, the, the business realities of, of need, wanting to grow a business and make profit. Um, and so, you know, it's all about presenting those choice points. And I, I haven't had an enormous amount of pushback yet. And, and this has been a tough year for businesses the last year. I mean, we've come through a pandemic. All of these lockdowns, you can imagine, are affecting the sale of alcohol through bars and clubs and those sort of things. And so, you know, our travel business, which is all duty free, is just has just just basically disappeared to nothing um and so you know i'm surprised actually there's not been more pushback but it is about presenting those choice points in the right way Thank, thanks kirsty i mean your your talk there about the, the sort of business realities and the pressure towards growth actually leads me seamlessly to uh, one of the other um uh questions which is a question from dean dean I, you should talk now Perhaps to ask your question. Yeah, um, it's a very simple question. You sort of in the um, video you mentioned, you know, about uh, Diageo, Diageo basically wanting to grow and grow and grow. Um, it's already a big company, so what's wrong with stability rather than growth? Hmm. Now, <laughs> I'm not an economist, so it's probably quite a difficult question for me to ask. You know, I, my acceptance is that the company wants to grow. Uh, and what my job for the company is to help them to decouple growth from consumption, is to allow them to continue that economic growth, that business growth, um, while consuming less. And so I will be, I'll be very honest with you. I don't question their need to grow 
what I do is provoke the need to consume more and grow at the same time. Okay. I mean, that, that's Dean, do you want to come back on that? No, no, no. I mean, uh, you know, I, I think it is a, a, a reality of life as we stand at the moment that companies want to grow. But um, we've been hearing some very interesting uh, talks over the last couple of days where people were challenging that. And I just thought it was worth challenging. You, you won't be surprised to know, Kirsty, that Dean is one of my students. Um, I, I, I wanted to raise. I wanted to raise something with you about the nature of of the sustainability y y yourself as a kind of sustainability lead in a company, which is the sense in which you know there's some things which are transferable um, that you can you know you can take LCA from one company to the other, and you can think about you know scope one, two, and three emissions in one company or in another company. Some which are which are rather different, and in a sense, the rather different ones. Um, are those that are related to the product itself and the question of social license. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to kind of reflect on your experience in, you know, moving from electronics to, um, to alcohol in the context of, of that social license question. Yeah, I, th I, think it's, I think it's an interesting question because many companies are challenged by social license. You know, when I was with uh, HP, there were questions about our equipment as PCs being used to uh, um, promote terrorist networks, for example. Um, and this is how people communicate these days, is using uh, PCs and electronics and those sort of things. And, and has, that, has that caused? And I think that, you know, the big tech companies are still answering questions about social license. Um, and it's absolutely right that we should hold them to account on that. Equally, I think the same is to do with, with alcohol, is that, um, you know, it, it is, and that's why within our positive drinking program, as you saw, we promote very much messages of moderation. The, the aim of Diageo is that you drink better, not more. And so this is very much why we lead towards the premium products. Uh, and in, the, in fact, there's a word that I've come across since I've started here, which is premiumization. Uh, which is a very enjoyable word. Uh, and, you know, that's the intent of the company is to move much more towards that premiumization. So again, with those messages around the aspects around social harm that happens from alcohol, and then also those messages around drink better, not more. Um, I, I think, you know, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's it, that that is that is where the company goes. But I think how, do, how does it fit when, I mean, when you're moving from, you know, one sector to the other, how do you kind of navigate that in personal terms, in terms of the responsibilities of your job? Um, I, I didn't find it. I, I don't find it that there is such a big dichotomy, to be honest with you. Mm. Um, I think that there are the aspects of social uh, impact are different between the two uh, companies. You know, I spent a lot of time in HP talking about conflict minerals and hazardous hazardous chemicals. That is, that is, those conversations aren't happening now. Uh, and so that knowledge I've parked, <laughs> maybe I'll get to use them in my next job again. Um, but actually, uh, conversations around uh, circularity and uh, social uh, social impact from our products and this sort of thing, that that is that is still relevant. And and I, yeah, I. I've been surprised, to be honest with you, about how much has worked. But yeah. it's not worked. <laughs> okay, good. I mean, th there were a couple of questions. I, I won't, I won't call the individuals, but the, the, you know, that was prompted to me from someone called Ray Manley, who's asking about, you know, the product itself and alcohol as a product and and that sort of social responsibility, which the video touched on, obviously. Um, but I think your, your point there is that there is a kind of social license question for almost every industry at that point. Um, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going to ask Neil to ask his question. Neil, if you're still there, um, an interesting question about the motivation for engaged sustainability. My question was to do with the the sort of reasoning behind senior management's engagement with sustainability um, and to what extent is it driven for intrinsic reasons that they really believe in a sustainability agenda or is it really driven by the benefits of um, branding and marketing which is seem to me quite clear 
there's a real advantage for that when you looked at the promotional video um, and the various um, press releases. Yeah. But so that's what part A of the question. But part B is in your experience from working for other companies, does it does the motivation of senior management actually matter, or is it simply that they want to go for the sustainability? Okay. So so what I would say is that in terms of the marketing of sustainability it can be quite difficult to get across complicated sustainability topics and aspects to the consumer. So that's why I say it's a vision of mine. So that when, when the average person walks into a bar and chooses, you know, what am I going to drink tonight? And they make that choice on sustainability credentials. I, I mean, I think that's a massive mountain to climb to try and get that type of thing across to people. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's that easy, and therefore we have to keep doing it, keep doing it until we keep people become a lot more educated, if you like, in terms of what does it mean actually mean to be zero carbon, uh, and what do you think a company's done? So I think that's quite a big challenge in itself. With regard to how important and, and is it important to senior management, um, I think that if it is not important to senior management as a sustainability professional, it's a damn hard job to do. Um, because it is senior management that sign off how many people you can hire, how much money you get to spend in your budget, uh, the sort of projects that you get to invest in, those sort of things. So it is really helpful to have senior management engagement. And in particular, when it comes to those trade-offs of of business decision-making, you know, it's to help them see that, okay, well, what does the scenario look like if we are not sustainable, if we make an unsustainable choice here um, versus a sustainable one? So, Sometimes there is a intrinsic, you know, you know, there's very few people these days I've come across who don't believe in sustainability or don't believe in climate change anymore. I think what's coming more and more is an understanding of the risk if you do nothing or if you don't do enough and what risk that poses to the longevity and the profitability of your business. Um, so at the moment, for example, there is this huge, I'm sorry, Tim, this is turning into quite a long answer, but there is, a, there is a very big program that the UK government has put on, and it, currently it's voluntary, but it will become mandatory, and it's called the Task Force for Climate-Related uh, Financial, Financial. Oh, yeah. Yeah. TCFD. So I manage that program on behalf of Diageo, and what that really is doing is about calculating the risk to the company of climate change. And the easy way to look at it is that physical change. So we have our biggest rum distillery is in the US Virgin Islands. It has been hit by two hurricanes in the last decade, and the climate modelling is predicting more severe and more hurricanes. So the question then comes is that, is it feasible to continue to have that distillery in USVI, or should we be moving it to inland Colombia, Venezuela, Brazil, pick a big country uh, away from the coast? Equally, there is also then, that's physical risk, there's also this transition risk, which is if we do nothing, then carbon taxes will increase, What will be our carbon taxation? That's money off the bottom line. You just pay off to governments around the world. And then the other transition risk is that if you do nothing and consumer sentiment changes against your products, what is the the potential damage to your business? And here you think about the David Attenborough effect with the plastic straw up the turtle's nose. If you're a plastic straw manufacturer, I would argue that you've probably swapped quite quickly out of making plastic straws or you've gone out of business now because almost everybody shifted overnight. And so that's, you know, there there is a greater and greater level of understanding in senior management of the risk of doing nothing or not doing enough. That's a really interesting answer. I mean, it covers quite a lot of the questions that have come in, you know, talking about the kind of motivation and the potential conflict between business objectives and sustainability. Um, I'm just going to allow someone else. It's a similar sort of, question in a way but it's more specifically oriented towards the economic implication it's george julianos um, uh, george i'm going to uh, promote you to allow you to ask this question hello hi there we hear you uh, hello there um thank you for allowing me to ask this in person um exactly on what nail uh, asked before and uh, your answer um, because you, you hope that uh, consumers will change their behavior and prefer your products because they're more sustainable. You approach 
um, um, you, you know, you, you choose to produce more sustainably uh, with all these actions you described. Um, the question is, when it comes to consumer preference, the vast majority uh, chooses based on the price, okay? So my question was actually uh, on that and how all these investments are going to affect the prices of your products or whether these will be financed by the profitability of your company showing that your um, shareholders and senior management are actually into this and they're doing it exactly because they believe in, in the sustainable goals. Because um, expecting consumers to make the choice of sustainability, I think it's unfair and it's, it's gonna delay the success of the purpose. So mm -hmm. it has to be, uh, most shares should be uh, from your side. Thanks, thanks, George. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so I'll unpick that a little bit then. So, yes, I agree that the majority of consumers probably won't make those choices based on sustainability. However, the example I just gave with the plastic straws shows that consumers, however much they know or they don't know about sustainability, if, you, if the message comes out and it's clear and it's obvious what you've got to do, then they will change. And they might not know why they are doing it, but they will do it. And so I, I would just I would just push back a little bit on the con consumers will never change because I think they will. The other thing I'd like to bring into this is then I also talked about value chain partners in my sort of summation. We are not the only people in here. There are a lot of retail partners who are pushing very hard on, um, let's say, you know, like uh, less packaging, lighter weight packaging. Uh, on use of plastic, on recycled content. So not only are these targets ones that we have set to ourselves, they are also targets that our value chain partners are setting on us as well. So for example, we're currently having a conversation with Amazon about compact by design. Now, I don't know what they mean by that, and they're not entirely sure what they mean by that, but we're working with Amazon to work out what they mean by that, because they've worked on things about their own packaging, and now they're coming to different segments that they're selling and saying, what, what does it mean to be compact by design? And so, you know, the, I think, you know, the push will come from multiple parts of our value chain, not only from consumers. Um, and then I think, you know, the other question you asked really, uh, and I'll come back to you, is that there, there won't be one thing that we'll do. There'll be many, many, many things that we will do. And that's what I meant by a pick and mix approach is that, you can't hang your hat on only one thing to shift the needle for you. And that's what I've learned over the last 28 years is that you pull every single lever that you can lay your hands on. Uh, and that's what will, which will move things. And some things will move it a lot and some things will move it a little bit, but every piece counts. Thanks, Kirsty. Um, I, I want to shift the direction a little bit and, and apologies to those on the Q&A who think that the, the, moderation, the moderation of questions is undemocratic. It is, um, <laughs> unfortunately, time, time permitting. Um, and we'll, we'll definitely try and work a technology out where people can vote for which questions should be answered. Um, whether that'll make a better discussion or not, I'm not absolutely sure. But I just wanted to shift uh, direction a little bit, Kirsty. This is a, a really interesting uh, question in the realm of um, uh, human rights. And I just, I'm going to promote you, Alice, to ask this question in person. You should be there. Great. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for the presentation, I found as well extremely interesting. Um, I think uh, I was just, the question I had was around sort of just transitions, and you mentioned transitions actually in reference to the series um, in the uh, with RUM, and I was wondering whether um, that's being incorporated into the framing and the work that you're doing is looking at kind of ensuring that the sort of low carbon or carbon based reduction activities that you're focusing on are also incorporating looking at sort of just transition and human rights and the sort of implications for the not just the people in the supply chains but also the broader communities connected to the supply chains that you are that are your supply chains sorry yeah yeah so I, so I think you know, this is what I would call um, 
you know, perhaps it, it doesn't, it's not very scientific approach, it, it sounds, but I would call getting two birds with one stone, really, is what I would be looking is that the investments that we're making into these novel technologies in particular are looking to impact on other parts of sustainability credentials that we're, we, are, we are aiming for as well. Uh, that whole area around inclusion and diversity, for example. And so, you know, we have also targets, and I didn't go into them today, but we have targets about uh, representation, female and diverse representation in our supply chain uh, and by suppliers that we work with uh, and what happens to that. We have a lot of, uh, um, within that water replenishment, a lot of that is about community access to water. Uh, and, you know, you'll understand that it's that's part of our license to operate. You know, you truly cannot be using water to brew beer and distill spirits if the local community doesn't have enough water to grow their crops, wash their hands and flush their toilets and cook their food. So, you know, it, it, we are part of an ecosystem within a community and that's the way we tend to view it. So that might not be quite such a specific answer, but, you know, th there is a lot more that we have on it if you go to our website and you'll be able to see more on that. Thanks, Kirsty. In terms of kind of seeing more, there was a question early on from a sharp eyed viewer, uh, Rachel, who um, something on one of your slides called 1% for the planet. Um, mm -hmm. I wondered, could you say a little bit more about that? Rachel was also an alum alumni of, of um, Surrey. She studied music, graduated in 1994. Uh, yeah, very good. So um, this is from our, one of our brands, Seedlip. Um, so Seedlip is a, is a zero alcohol uh, brand uh, that you might have come across. Um, and it, it is what we would call one of our born good brands. So it is, it is designed from the outset to be sustainable, to be uh, um, in all of that sort of society 2030 types of ways. So um, Seedlip is a, is, um, well, I'm not sure we've quite got it over the line, but we, we expect it to, be, it to be a B Corp, for example. And that 1% is about giving back 1% of its profits to uh, um, in planetary investments. And so I'm not entirely sure what Seedlip, I don't have all the details of what Seedlip are going to do there. You, again, you'll probably find more on their own website about that. Uh, but that's what it means. And, and there are other companies and other brands doing that, like there is with B Corp as well. Fantastic. And then I'm going to uh, ask uh, Lena to, to ask her question online, which is uh, always very interesting. I remember we had conversations about this back in the day. Um, uh, Lena, you're... You should be able to talk now. Yes. Hi there. Hi. Um, yeah, my question was about um, whether you looked into the option to collect old bottles, right? Empty them, refill. Um, I know that obviously some some do that, not even just in, um, in the alcoholic or beverages industry, but some others even in beauty. I suspect there might be some additional costs actually that are, against the sustainability sustainability message, but I was just wondering whether you looked into this and then what were your key learnings and takeaways? Yeah, th thanks, Lena. So we do actually do that already. Uh, so um, particularly in our African markets and also in our Central American and Caribbean markets, um, all of the Guinness bottles are recovered from the market, are washed and refilled. Um, and so we already have that type of wash and refill circular uh, bottle um, methodology going on. I, th I think this is what I find quite interesting about this is that, uh, you know, when I take a step back from, from a company position is that it seems like in, in Western democratic nations, we seem to have gone away from this reuse mentality and that we everything has to be new and it has to be shiny, it has to look perfect. And, and we don't want to have something that's been reused. And yet in other markets that perhaps where but, you know, where resources are, are more valued, um, you know, this refill and reuse of bottles is a much more common thing to happen. And so actually what I would hope to see, Lena, is that we will take the learnings from those markets and we will expand them into other markets. And again, you'll see later in this year, uh, one of my projects I've been working on is our circular economy strategy. And we have some really super examples from both sides of, of the uh, biological and the technical cycle um, in Diageo of, 
uh, remanufacturing, reuse, refilling, uh, the use of waste materials from the brewing and distilling process and what they go on to do, those nutrients um, there. And, and so I think you'll see a lot more of this happening. And, and in fact, um, that I mentioned brand homes, the Johnny Walker brand home, which should have opened last summer and unfortunately didn't, so it's going to open, I hope, this summer. Um, is it's on Prince's Street and you can go along and have a Johnny Walker experience, do some tastings. There's a bar on the roof and you can buy stuff and all that sort of stuff. I have a look forward. That, that is carbon neutral right from the outset, that, that brand home. But also we've designed a dispensing system for the tasters that you get. So rather than coming out of a bottle each time, um, actually, what we've designed is a very special a sort of bulk delivery system, really using, I, I mean, they look like kegs, to be honest with you, or barrels, metal barrels of whiskey. And they're on a they're on a dispense system a little bit like beer is in a pub, but for whiskey. And I, I know that sounds really obvious. And yet that's not how people expect their whiskey to be poured. They expect it to be poured out of a pretty looking bottle instead of coming from a tap. So, you know, it's challenging those types of norms, I think, is the way to extend this uh, product as a service, this uh, refilling and reuse, uh, and then that reduction in the, in the, in the packaging um, that we will use. So I think there'll always be a place for a pretty glass bottle on a shelf um, yeah. because people like to look at them. It is then, okay, what do we do with yeah. that? And we have all sorts of uh, pilots coming up around that as well. So okay. you might yeah, not we see them. Because what we might do is we might do them with the on trade, so bars and clubs to begin with. Uh, yeah, where yeah. actually, if you think about it, that's where the big volume goes through. Yeah, um, no, exactly. Yeah, because I remember you mentioned earlier um, how recycling is done in Germany. So I'm from Germany, and I'm I'm, over, I'm basically used to bringing everything back, right? And then uh, since I'm in the UK, I was quite surprised. Everything is plastic, and even glass, you just throw away. So it's just interesting how also different countries um, manage this, right? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, right. Lena. Um, we started with with sort of technical questions. We ended on a, on that was a sort of technical question. What I've tried to do in selecting the questions is to give you a sort of broad sense of both the technical and also the street strategic. And and we're kind of running towards the end now, Kirsty. I wondered if I could just finish with a a sort of more personal reflection, given that this is a series. Um, you know, asking alumni for their expertise, but also their experience of of, of what it means to be a, a graduate uh, from Surrey, and 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 the the series itself is called you know what it takes in a way. I guess my question to you be, what does it take to to keep you going in this area? What is it that motivates you? Why are you still? as a Surrey graduate working towards this mysterious goal of sustainability and, and, and just a little reflection on both the challenges and the highlights of that. Yeah, yeah thanks for the question. I think, so uh, I think what it takes uh, from a personal perspective, particularly now, <laughs> having been at home for a year, like everybody has been, is fortitude and persistence. Uh, and I've had to, like a lot of people this year, I've had to dig really quite deep uh into into those those elements of me um so i think you know on a personal level that's what it's taken i think on a if i think about it sort of more on a professional level um the reason that i've stayed in sustainability for as long as i have and i, I you know i have had options in my career to move in different directions but one of the reasons i love sustainability and i love it particularly in a corporate environment is as you probably have seen, I get to stick my fingers in just about any pie that there is. So I could go talk to HR about inclusion, diversity and human rights. I can go talk to finance about carbon accounting. I could go talk to procurement about, about manufacturing glass bottles in a completely different way. Uh, I can go talk to marketing about how do we get these messages across to consumers? Um, how do we understand what consumers need and in fact drive that demand from consumers? I can go talk to the board. I can talk to investors. And, you know, in the nine months I've been at Diageo, I don't think I've talked to, there's not a single part of a corporate function that I haven't already spoken to. And so that's what I love about sustainability. And I think a lot of people say about making a difference. For me, that's a bit of, sort of a given, is that you're going to make a difference. I mean, everybody wants to make a difference in their job. And sustainability is particularly purposeful. Um, and so for me, 
you know, when I think about, you know, we talk a lot about personal purpose and particularly in a corporate world. And sometimes, you know, you're asked to describe your purpose. For me, my purpose is in connecting dots and driving towards that bigger picture by pulling small things together to make that bigger picture. So like I described about that investment in that bottling line in one of our African markets, I was able to pull into that conversation, why don't we work on a collection and recycling infrastructure? Why don't we kickstart that in that country? It doesn't exist. And we can brand it with the local brand. This is Malta, which is like a, um, uh, it's like a zero alcohol Guinness. It's like a, I, I mean, it, it's quite an acquired taste, really. Uh, to be honest, it's quite thick. Uh, and, uh, but people drink it um, because it, it's quite, it, for people who like it, it, it's, it, it's actually quite a healthy drink as well. Lots of B vitamins and all that type of stuff in it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's very, and we can drive that with the brand. And so then the brand and marketing team can get behind that as well as us, and I can bring in concepts around circular economy and all this type of stuff. And so that's, that's what drives me, Tim. That's, that's what the, motivates me. It's, and I love it. And I, I'm not going to stop. That's, 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 that's really, really good. I mean, I do suspect, Kirsty, that that little bit, particularly in the middle where you're talking about, you know, having purpose and connecting dots, you're going to end up in one of the university's branding videos at some point with a, <laughs> an excellent soundtrack, just like the one we started with at the beginning. And, and people are going to flock to the university to become alumni just like you and to do good and have, and, and be, have an interesting career and, and to be meaningful and purposeful in the world. Um, it's, it's been a real privilege to talk to you again. Um, we've connected off and on over the years, but it does kind of take me right back to those early days and that first cohort. And, and it was an example, I think, of Surrey, really taking a kind of pioneering position in relation to sustainability that's been incredibly important to the university ever since. So, And thank you again uh, to the participants for all your questions. Apologies to those we didn't get to, uh, but mostly thank you to you, Kirsty, for um, a wonderful talk and for fielding so many questions um, for us with such a passion. You're, you're very welcome and thank you for inviting me. And again, that, as you said, thank you for all the questions. It's great to talk to such an engaged um, audience uh, and maybe, maybe next time we'll be able to do it in real life. Who knows? Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't I just, to, to any participants who would like to, I believe the moderators have put in the chat box um, uh, a link to uh, a feedback questionnaire. Um, most of the comments that I saw coming through and that we didn't have time to talk to, to on the Q&A were, were all very grateful and thankful to you, um, Kirsty, for the clarity of your presentation. And... Um, we will, as I said before, be sending out a link to all participants with, um, with access to a recording of the event in due course. Thank you all very much. Bye. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.